hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches in America close their doors each year because people are not going to church like they used to. When I was growing up, people went to church. I mean, even people that weren't saved, they went to church because there wasn't very much entertainment to be had anywhere else. They'd go to church and just listen to the preaching and the singing. And now we've got iPhones and, <coughs> and uh, iPads and iPods and computers of all sorts and TV, internet connected TV, so you can see about anything you want to see. We've got all sorts of activities going on. And people are not as interested in church as they used to be. And young people are growing up in Bible-believing churches and they go to church because mom and dad makes them and mom and dad ought to make them, don't you think? I mean, if they're living in my house, they're going to go to church. There ain't going to be any of this business, oh, dad, do we have to go? Yeah, you got to go. I don't want to. Then go get your own place to live and buy your own groceries. <laughs> and, uh, but as soon as they grow up, a lot of our young people are graduating high school and never returning to the church house. And because they don't come, a lot of smaller churches, you know what the average size of church is in America right now? Do you know that we're either average or slightly above? Now, if you look around you, you'll say, oh, that can't be. It is. <laughs> and about 45 to 50 Sunday morning attendance is the average. There are fewer mega churches than ever before. Now, there's still some mega churches, but they're very few. They're like 1% of all churches that exist are mega churches running 2,000 or more. Most of them are the size of ours. And many of those are closing because of non attendance. And by the way, you folks showed up tonight, and so by your presence, you just cast a vote to keep the church open. Those who didn't come, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> well, what can we do about it? Well, I said last week in, in our message about the presence of God that a lot of people come to church and they've got four or five or six reasons why they won't go back anymore. And uh, some of them were immorality among the leadership or the church membership and some of it was because they didn't feel welcome there and some of the reasons were that uh, they just didn't feel the presence of God. They didn't feel the presence of God. And we talked about that last week. I want to take us just a little bit further with that thought tonight in our Bible study concerning how great a God we have. And we're going to talk about that tonight in Psalm chapter 111. It's only 10 verses long. I don't think I'll get through all of them tonight. And if we don't, <clears throat> we'll still go home at a decent hour and just pick it up next week. My sermons are kind of like boxcars. You can just unhook and hook them back on wherever you want to. Psalm 111 and verse number 1. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Well, we're in the congregation tonight, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, if, you, uh, if you think people ought to praise the Lord, lift your hand. All right, now you just, had a, you just had an experience. You raised your hand in worship. You didn't know you'd ever do that, did you? <laughs> a little trickery there. But the Lord deserves to be praised. And it says in verse 2, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endureth forever. He hath made, who are we talking about? We're talking about God. Stay with us here in verse number four. He hath made his wonderful works to be, next word, remembered. What are we doing tonight? We're remembering what God has done. The Lord is gracious, and boy, I'm glad about that, aren't you? <laughs> and full of compassion. Boy, I'm really glad about that too. Uh, I need his compassion. You know, if, if I was God, I'd probably step on some people and squash them like bugs. And you better be glad you got the God you've got instead of me. You know what I mean? God is full of grace and compassion. Verse 5, He hath given meat unto them that fear Him. He will ever be mindful of His covenant. He hath showed His people the power of His works. 
that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. You know, in the kingdom age one day, we're going to have a kingdom. The Lord's going to be ruling, and the heathen are going to be out of here, and we're taking over. <laughs> Verse 7, the works of his hands are verity. That means truth. Verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. Verse 8. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Now reverend there I don't believe is used in the form of a noun. Uh, reverend being an adjective describing his name is to be reverenced. He's to be He's to be lifted up. He's to be honored. We're supposed to revere him. And so I know a lot of preachers say, don't call, I get mad if you call him reverend. And they're afraid, uh, only the Lord's supposed to be called reverend. Well, I don't care for the title reverend. I mean, I don't get mad if somebody calls me that. I don't prefer it. And, uh, but it's not because of a theological issue. The Lord's name is reverend or to be reverenced. Verse number 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise. There's our subject again all the way through this Psalm 111. His praise endureth forever. Father, we pray that you'd bless us tonight as we study for a few moments on how great is our God. Lord, you are a glorious God. You're a majestic God. You're a powerful God. You are the one and only God. And Father, we pray that tonight you'd help us to connect with you in such a way that we understand what worship is and we understand what praise is. We understand how grateful we ought to be for what you've done for us. And Lord, when we come together in corporate worship, we pray that you'd help us not to be ashamed to praise you. And, and when we're talking to people out in the community, we're not embarrassed to bring your name up. We're just in love with you, Lord, and we want you to bless us tonight. If you would, please, we'd be grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned last week that there was a research poll and that found that among those reasons why people say they're not going back to church anymore, one of them was they just didn't feel like they connected with God at the church house. Well, this, this psalm has to do with a congregation. Not the same thing as a New Testament church congregation, but it's a congregation. And it's in a public place, a public setting, corporate worship where people are together. And uh, I think we as a New Testament church can learn a lot about what God likes in this passage of Scripture, in corporate praise and worship. This research poll said there's a lot of people coming back because they didn't sense the presence of God. They just hadn't connected with God. Now I don't know if they if they expected if it was because their expectations were too high. I don't know if they expected a warm fuzzy feeling that didn't happen. I don't know if they expected lightning and thunder. I don't know if they expected some unique revelation that would that would just be earth shattering, earthquakes. I don't know what they expected. I have a an idea that People are a lot like I've experienced here in the past. This doesn't happen every week, but there have been weeks I can remember over the years where after I'd preached a sermon, it wasn't particularly different than the other sermons to me. But on the way out, I could see on some people's face the look of boredom and maybe even distaste. Like maybe they'd wasted their time and they like they're wanting to get out of here. And other people would come by and say, Preacher, that sermon was exactly what I needed. And boy, it lifted me up. That showed me some things that I had forgotten or didn't know. And that's the best sermon I've heard in years. Two different people had two different experiences. And you know what I'm talking about. You can be sitting there in a pew and you can have a revival meeting going on while the preaching's going on or while the singing's going on and the person sitting right beside of you may be bored to tears and say, man, I'll be glad when he gets through and let's get out of here. And so I don't think it's so much what's going on in the church service as it is in our heart. 
when we are connected with God and we come with an expectation of knowing what pleases God instead of making me the focus, instead of you making you the focus, instead of those people who never come back again, instead of them going to church thinking that they are the center of everything, maybe they need to make God the center and things would be a lot different. <laughs> kind of like you may have seen this little meme. I saw it on the internet a while back where one guy went to church and as he was leaving, he, the usher, one of the ushers took out his hand and shook his hand and said, glad you were here today. He said, well, I just wanted you to know. The man said, I just didn't enjoy the worship today. The usher said, well, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you anyway. <laughs> I think people get the idea somehow, somehow that somebody else is supposed to plug us into God and make us worship Him and somehow there'll just be lightning bolts flying from everywhere and because something magical happened, we worship and praise God. I think it starts in here. And we have to know God. We have to know God. If we don't know Him, we don't know what worship is. And we have to know something about Him. <clears throat> Tonight we have read in Psalm 111, a very interesting psalm, <clears throat> and it's one of, the, one of several psalms that follow all the way from here to Psalm 118 called the Hallel Psalms. Hallel being the first phrase of Hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, it's the Hallelujah Psalms, they're the Hallel Psalms, they're the Praise God Psalms. And that's what we're talking about tonight. This psalm is deep and rich in praise and admiration and adoration. And I want us to examine this beautiful text tonight so that we'll get this thought down in our heart of just how great God is. I mean, you can look up in the sky at night and, and peer across light years of space and you think, well, that's a great God that created all that, but that's not all he's done. Hey, we have a great God that's done a lot more than that. He just flung those stars out probably in one, one handful and there wasn't a lot to that for God. Him dealing with you and me, that's the big miracle. <laughs> I want to point out a couple of things tonight. We're going to talk about the worship of God and the work of God. Let's take first the worship of God. In verse number 1, notice it with me again. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Notice the encouragement in the first part of that verse. There's encouragement there. It's the universal praise the Lord, which means the same thing as hallelujah. And uh, it just breaks forth from the psalmist here. He, his heart is in tune with God. And it's just like somebody has just tickled his gizzard, boy, and he's just, he's just delighted in the Lord. And that's what we need to have in our church service. We need to be delighted in the Lord instead of looking like we just ate a quart of sour pickles. <laughs> delighted. And it starts in here. The, the, the psalmist just breaks out. Boy, praise the Lord. He's having a good time. And uh, notice the experience of it in the last part of the verse. <coughs> there is a, a worship experience here. He said, I'll praise <coughs> the Lord with my whole heart. Uh, in the assembly. And so he, he said, I will. Do you notice that word will? Look at it again. I will praise the Lord. What does that sound like? It sounds like a determination. It sounds like he's made up his mind. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm not going to let somebody else have all the fun. I'm not going to let everybody else just praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. And he made up his mind. And I think you and I have to do the same thing. We have to say, I will praise the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about having a circus fit or a, some sort of lunatic spasm. I'm talking about honest to goodness praise coming from the heart. And it doesn't have to be with a big show. It just needs to be genuine. I personally believe that this psalmist had no other choice. His heart was so full, he just had to praise the Lord. It's kind of like when you have to cough, you've got a tickle in your throat, it's hard to hold that back, isn't it? You just got to do it. Or you ever have a sneeze? I'm one of those one in ten, <laughs> Brother Jonathan, that has to sneeze. When I get out in the bright sunlight in the morning, it tickles something inside my nose. It's not allergies, it's the sunlight. One out of ten people have that gene that makes them sneeze in the bright sunlight. When I go, 
bless you. Man, it's, it's there. I can't stop it. I don't want to stop it. I want to let her fly. They say you'll have back problems if you hold your sneezes back. You don't want to have back problems, do you? And you don't want to have back problems and you don't want to have praise problems. And so when it's, when it's coming on, just let her fly. As, uh, as one fellow said, just let her rip, tater chip. Let her go. He just couldn't help himself. Worship is devoted. He said, I will praise the Lord in that verse with my, what kind of heart? Whole heart. His, his attention wasn't divided. He didn't say, well, I'll praise the Lord if I hadn't got anything else to do. I'll praise the Lord unless I'm involved in a softball game. I'll praise the Lord in the congregation unless I'm going to a party somewhere. He said, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Lord, you've got it. You've got my heart. You have my allegiance. You're the one that needs to be praised. And all of these other things may or may not happen, but they are just peripheral things. Praise the Lord. He's first in my heart. And that's the way we ought to look at the Lord. He gets first shot at everything. Don't you think so? Nothing was held back. It starts in our inner man. And by the way, it's hard to praise the Lord unless you remember something that he's done for you and you remember how good he is. It begins in the memory of the inner man. That's why we need to think on the Lord. That is seed for praise. Well, I think that might have been what something like this might have been on the mind of Jesus when he said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, when he was asked the question, What's the greatest thing to do? He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's kind of like the same thing as your whole heart. <laughs> all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. With everything that's within me, I ought to devote my praise, my worship towards him. Nobody else can do what he can do. And nobody else can meet my needs like he's met my needs and is going to meet my needs. Nobody else can provide a home in heaven like he has provided. Why shouldn't I praise the Lord with my whole heart? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Well, we gather several times a week in most churches to call it worship service. I just wonder how much worshiping goes on though, really. I mean, some people go to church out of duty, and boy, I'd rather have people out of duty than any, you know, if they hadn't got any other reason to be here but just duty, I'm glad they're here. Uh, but boy, I'd hate just to worship the Lord and attend church just out of nothing but the sense of duty. You know what I'm talking about? I ought to love Him, not just say, well, I've got to go to church tonight. You know what? I'm the preacher. If I don't show up, people, what people think about me anyway? <laughs> I thought about this several times and over the years. I may do it someday. I thought about just not showing up for church and on Sunday morning and maybe about 15 after 11, somebody will call and say, Preacher, are you okay? Where are you at? I just thought I wouldn't go today. I didn't feel well. <laughs> yeah. And just let people sit here, you know. <laughs> I mean, is it any more responsibility for me to praise and worship the Lord and to serve the Lord than it is everybody else? I don't think so. I think we all ought to praise and worship Him. I think we all ought to serve Him. But somehow we just think it's, it's the leadership that's supposed to do that. Well, all of us ought to do it, every one of us. Now, His worship is displayed. He, look, look at this. In, in that verse it says, In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. His praise and worship is not hidden under a bushel. His praise and worship is just laid right out there in the middle of the assembly, in the middle of the congregation. He's just there, and he's not holding it back. He wants to, he's one of those guys probably got a smile on his face. You know, you think he looks like the cat that ate the canary. What's he up to? And people that find their joy in the Lord find themselves smiling a lot, though. Don't you think so? And... Uh, and that praise and worship just has a way of working itself out. Now, I'm all for personal worship. I think you can get out under a tree and take your Bible and 
read and pray and just have a good time with the Lord, just you and the Lord out in the middle of the, of the garden or out in the backyard or in your room or in a closet or wherever you get to talk to the Lord and read the Word of God. I think personal worship is wonderful and great and it shouldn't be dispensed of. But neither should corporate worship. I, I've just never been of that mindset where I think, well, maybe I'll go meet with the congregation and worship this week. Maybe I won't. And I've never been of that mindset. I've always thought I'm supposed to be there. You know, I think the Lord wants me to be there. And I think the Lord wants me to encourage other people around me. And he uses you to encourage other people around you. And if you're having a pretty good time, you know, when it's, even when the preacher's hoeing down your row, you know, and it kind of has a little pain to it, it's okay to praise and worship the Lord there. <laughs> I, I've been in some church services when I wasn't the one doing the preaching. Man, the preacher was hitting me just kind of broadside. All I knew to do was just say, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. You know, hitting me a little bit there, but I guess I needed that. Mm. We need to gather together. You know why people are dropping out of church? They don't see the need to meet together corporately, and they're just having their personal worship time maybe at home or in some little Bible study group somewhere. I don't think that's the way God wants it. God puts a great premium upon the congregation, Old Testament and New. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but so much more as you see the day approaching. Boy, that day is approaching, isn't it? I think it's getting close. I know every preacher has always said, you know, maybe, maybe the Lord's coming in my lifetime, and that's the blessed hope. I think things are different than it's ever been before. I don't know if he's coming in my lifetime. I think it would be a grand thing for him to do, though. <laughs> I just, I, you talk about praising and worshiping the Lord, going up in the rapture. Man, I think that's a, that would be, I've never been real wild, you know, and run around the room. I threatened to a time or two just to wake people up, pull my shoes off and run around the auditorium while I'm preaching in a circle. <laughs> I, I've never done that. I don't expect I ever will. But if I was going to do something like that, it'd probably be while I'm going up in the rapture. Boy, I'd have a, I'd have a shouting spell, I think. Well, we're supposed to come together. And worship is, is diverse. Look at this again. Uh, in, in verse 1, he says, Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. You know, within a congregation, you've got a lot of different kinds of people, don't you? I mean, you've got some extroverts and you've got some introverts and you've got some just plain verts. <laughs> We've got all kinds of people. Every one of us is a little bit different. Boy, I'm glad, aren't you? I'd hate for all of us to be just alike. Boy, it'd be a pretty dull and boring place, wouldn't it? And so we're all a little bit different. And I, I'm an introvert, actually. I, I enjoy my alone time. And I like to get alone and read the Bible and pray and things like that. And I just like some time to have a talk with myself, just be alone. I enjoy my own company, you know. But I don't want to be by myself all the time. I'm glad when I'm here and I'm with you. I like that. And we're all different. Some people are ex extroverts, man. They're going around slapping everybody on the back and having a hoorah time. And, and uh, they need to be around people. So it'll kind of give them a place to let all that energy out. And us introverts, it gives us a place where we can kind of come out of our shell. And so you'll find all different kinds of people who praise and worship the Lord in their way. And you don't have to be a copycat of anybody else. I mean, if I see somebody get up and run around the room pulling their socks and shoes off, first of all, I'd pinch my nose. But secondly, I don't think I'd have to do that just because they are. <laughs> all of us are a little bit different. And we can praise and worship the Lord and it all fits together like the pieces of a puzzle that's been cut out. We're a puzzle. You know, you ever see one of those hundred piece or there's a thousand piece puzzles, you know, you put it all together. And uh, Brother Denny was showing me one the other day, a puzzle he'd put together. It was, it was like a little 200 piece puzzle. He would put that together and he was so proud of it. And I, I said, how long did that take you? He said, Six months. I said, six months on that? He said, yeah. 
He said, that's pretty good, though. He said, it says on the box from three to five years. <laughs> We're a puzzle. We're a puzzle. And all of us are a little bit different. We've all got some little kinks and curves that somebody else doesn't have. And we, we fit together in that puzzle and we worship the Lord. And I think the Lord likes it that way. I'm glad he didn't make us all just alike. We're all different, but we're all needful. That's the worship of our Lord. I want to spend just a couple of minutes now on the works of God. In verse number 2, it says, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. So the works of God. Now we're thinking about how great God is tonight, right? And that will help us to have a worship experience that will be satisfying. And those people who come and go and don't know, maybe we can help explain to them the way you worship God is not by some magical formula. It's just by turning your heart towards Him and just coming and being here. And that's the way we worship the Lord. And the way we worship Him, what helps provoke us to worship is remembering the works of the Lord. What's he done for you? And that's why I wanted to do the praise and prayer time at the end of the service tonight. Because I think sometimes we don't put enough thought into what we ought to praise the Lord about. How do we know if we just flippantly go on our way and don't even think about the works of God, how has he worked in my life? Boy, when I think about the hellish life I lived before I got saved and how he came along and, and met me that one Sunday and, and just convicted my heart and made me want to get saved that day and how I went home rejoicing, thinking, boy, finally I'm saved. And boy, I was glad. And I'm still glad. But if I don't think back on things like that, I'll just kind of brush those things aside and say, well, I ain't got nothing to praise the Lord about. Do you know my arthritis is pretty bad? Do you know my ankles are swelled up? Do you know I have weak spells? Do you know how I've got to go to the doctor? And do you know this is wrong with me and that's wrong with me? You know the bad luck spells I've had lately? <laughs> and we can just go on and on about the things we want to be negative about. But we ought to take some time to think about the good things he's done for us. And then worship comes more naturally. They're great. The Bible says the works of the Lord are great. If you ever discover the pleasure, now notice the last part of that verse, it says, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. Where's that pleasure coming from? From recognizing what God has done for us. And it says sought out. That means we're looking for those things. Sought. It's not just things that happen to cross our mind every once in a while. It's things we think about on purpose. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so we purposely seek them out. And by thinking back about what God has done for us, the Bible says there's pleasure in that. If you ever discover the pleasure in the works of God, you'll be able to worship him a lot easier. Old Brother Brown, you remember Jim Brown used to preach for us every once in a while. He went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. And Old Brother Brown has come by. Every time he's coming through this area, he's kind of like Brother Winters. He'd want to come by and visit with us, you know, and maybe, maybe preach if we'd ask him and always ask him. And uh, he was staying over with us, spending the night, him and Miss Pat were spending the night with us. I... I think we might have had them come for some sort of a meeting. And Brother Brown was over at my house, and Aaron and I just decided we'd come across a pretty good steak recipe, how to cook steak on the grill. And it was, uh, I didn't tell him exactly, I don't think, how we were going to do it, but we, we just take those steaks, sprinkle them with kosher salt on both sides. I mean, cover those babies up with a quarter of an inch of salt. And you say, well, that's probably draw the moisture out. It pulls the water out so the, steam, the, the, the steaks actually cook inside instead of steaming inside. And it, it pulls out the necessary moisture 
so the outside will seal the moisture on the inside. And so we'd cover them with salt, brush that salt off when you get ready to throw them on the grill, and we'd just sprinkle a little bit of garlic powder, just a little bit of garlic powder and black pepper on them after that. And that's all we put. And they, they told me that at the, uh, out in Colorado in Denver. What was the name of that place? Trail Dust. Trail Dust Steakhouse. Our pastor out there would take me to eat Trail Dust every once in a while. I asked them what their recipe was. I figured they'd give me some complicated recipe, but that's all it was, just salt and pepper and a little bit of garlic powder. Well, I told Brother Brown, he was staying with us, that we're going to cook you some steaks tonight. I said, well, these steaks are larrapin, boy. They're larrapin, John. These will be the best steaks you've ever eaten. He said, now, Brooks, I've eaten steaks all over the world. You're going to have to do pretty good to beat the ones I've had before. I said, Brother Brown, these are good. We've discovered a way to cook them that they're going to be good. He said, well, you'll have to prove it to me. And you know how Brother Brown is. He's always, he's always playing the adversary. And I said, well, they're going to be good. Well, he just kept on, you know, making it, kind of downplaying it. We cooked those steaks, brought them in. We all sat down at the table and started to eat. He ate two or three bites of that, and he looked over at me. He said, Brooks, that may be the best steaks I've ever ate in this world. <laughs> you know what he found? He found the pleasure in those steaks and he was always willing to eat another one of those. And if you ever find the pleasure in what God has done for you, it'll be a whole lot better than any steak you've ever eaten. It'll be something you find pleasure in and the praise and the worship will flow easily. <coughs> He's great. God is great. He's great and he's to be sought out. Uh, once you've experienced real, genuine worship because you have focused upon how great God is, you'll keep coming back for more. Uh, when we lived in Oklahoma City, our next door neighbor had some, I forget what you call them, they're little flowers, some of you ladies will probably know. He had a whole backyard full of flowers. They were about this high and uh, they would bloom, blossom at dusk every night. They'd seal up tight in the daytime and at night you'd go out there and watch them and they didn't unfold real slowly. Those things would go boink <laughs> and they'd, just, they'd blossom just like that. My neighbor had those things for a long time and he, we were talking one day and I mentioned something about his flowers out there. He said, yeah, you've got to come over and see these things. He said, it's the greatest thing you've ever seen. He said, those things blossom every night at dusk after the sun goes down he said, I don't know if it's the humidity or just the lack of the sunlight, but he said, they'll, they'll bloom right in front of your eyes. And he said, you just got to come and see them. He said, come on over, bring your wife over tonight, and I want you all to see this. Oh, we went over next door after sundown, and we're standing there, and we're watching them, and we're talking, you know, and he said, now they'll bloom sooner or later here, and we're watching, and nothing's blooming. I think, this guy has fed me a line. <laughs> and we stood there and stood there and stood there, and all of a sudden, he said, look, there's one right there. And I looked, and it was already bloomed. I didn't get to see anything happen. I thought, well, that thing's probably already blooming. And he said, now, just watch real close, and you'll see them. In a few minutes, he said, oh, oh, there's one over there. And I looked, and it had already bloomed, and so I still wasn't convinced anything was happening. And he said, now, watch. Just keep your eyes open and kind of scan the whole yard, and you'll see them. And all of a sudden, I'm looking just at the right place, and one of them went, Bloop. It just popped open and bloomed right in front of me. I mean, just like you had shot it with a gun and it threw up its hands. <laughs> and those flowers started blooming all over that yard. That was such a magnificent sight. And I was just thinking, you know, that's the way the Lord is. He'll just blossom right in front of your eyes if you'll watch and see what he's doing. And if you'll think back and look at what he has done, you'll see his glory even greater than the glory of flowers. Well, it is glory. His work is honorable. In verse 3, it's honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He's not going to run out of splendor and majesty. It's going to just keep on lasting. God is so grand and majestic, he'll never run out of glory. <laughs> and it says in verse 4 that, his works are gracious. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. And he's mighty and gracious in our lives. I want you to be thinking about that when we come to the praise section tonight. Think about what he's done for you. Psalm 86 and verse 5 says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. 
Psalm 86, 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. His works are generous. Verse 5 and 6, if you'll notice that, you'll see his provision in verse number 5. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. God will take care of you. God's going to take care of you. You'll see his providence in verse number 6. He hath showed his people the power of his works that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. Oh, listen, we may not have a piece of ground like Israel had that he's talking about here that God had described and was going to give to them. and Well, he'd already given it to them at this time. And, uh, and David's just thinking aback, or whoever the psalmist is here, just thinking aback about what has happened. And so God is a great God. We just need to be reminded of that. Why do people not come to church and feel like they've connected to God? Maybe they don't remember Maybe something never happened to them. Maybe they need to be saved and if they'll stick around to hear the gospel, just maybe something big will happen. And if they have been saved and they just forgot how wonderful and lovely the Lord is, if they hang around where the word of God is preached, they'll be reminded. And if we stick around the the singing and the praising and the fellowship of God's people, man, it's catching and you want to latch on to it and you want to be part of that congregation. I wouldn't miss church for nothing. Well, we've got a lot to praise him for. Don't you? Let's pray together and we'll have a verse or two of invitation. And uh, after that, then we'll have our prayer requests and praise time and even some announcements. But I want you to just think, as we stand together, I want us to just think about how great God has been. And has he done something in your life? Let's stand if you don't mind. And uh, the piano is going to play right after we pray. And then if you need to come to the altar and pray, well, you're welcome to do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your wonderful, wonderful works, your greatness, your majesty and your power, your glory. Lord, you are so great. We can't even fathom that. As we look across something like the Grand Canyon and we can't see the bottom very well and we can't even see the other side very well because of its vastness and depth. Lord, you're even greater than that and I pray that you'd help us just to be awestruck with your greatness. May we praise and worship you the way we should on a daily basis and especially when we come to church, just have a heart full of gratitude that just spills over on others. Bless us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.